We're in week five of a series called Faith to Finish. Everybody one time say Faith to Finish. And today, um, I want to look at a character in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Faith, which is a New Testament writing of, about some of the characters and people that we admire from the Old Testament, stories of great faith. I want to look at a man named Gideon today and his faith journey. And in Hebrews 11, the writer says, kind of wrapping up, rounding out this book, says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon. I do, in fact, have time, though, so that's what I'm going to do today. I don't have time to talk about Gideon or Brock, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms. They administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword. Now, most scholars believe that this, this next line links directly to Gideon. So Gideon, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Now that's what it says in Hebrews, but let's take a quick look at Judges chapter six, where a thousand years earlier Gideon's story takes place. Just wanna read a couple of verses to you. Judges chapter six, verse one, it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. And so they're being persecuted, they're under oppression. And then we jumped all the way down to verses 11 and 12. And it says, one day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, which is what my grandfather called Oprah, um, and I couldn't get him to stop. Oprah, Oprah, I always said Oprah. Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress, out of sight of the Midianites. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. And today in week five of Faith to Finish, I want to preach a message I've entitled Fight by Faith. Fight by Faith. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, would you just speak clearly? distinctly. Holy Spirit, each and every one of us right now give you permission to preach the message that you want to preach to our hearts. We open ourselves to you. We are welcoming your conviction. We're welcoming your encouragement. Change us, mold us, and build our faith today, we pray in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And the church said together, amen. Go ahead and be seated today. Well, when we pick up on Gideon's story in Judges chapter 6, we find the people of Israel at a point in history known as the period of the judges. And so this was after their 400 years in slavery in Egypt and they've spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Now through Joshua, they finally made their way into the promised land. And this was prior to God allowing the people of Israel to have a king. They desperately wanted a king. And so before King Saul and King David and King Solomon, however, you had this period known as the judges. Now judges were not people like we would know the term judge today. A judge, according to Priscilla Shirer, which I love the way that she says this, judges were called, people who were called by God and empowered by God to unite the people of God to stand against the enemies of God. So he was one of these judges here in Judges chapter 6. And so we go back into our story in verse 1 to kind of gain a little bit of context. It says that the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because of this they were under the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, this evil they were doing, it was not so much an evil that they were doing to other people, but it was evil that was directed toward God. And it was evil that was not that they were shaking their fists at God, but basically what he was saying is that my people have turned from me and toward idolatry. The people of Israel had begun worshiping the gods of other surrounding nations. And God, basically what he does is he comes to them, he says, okay, if you don't want me, then fine, have it your way. Now, this reminds me of what happened in my life a couple of weeks ago between me and my four-year-old son, Carson, who turns five in two days, everybody. And so Carson and I, we're getting up early in the morning on Saturday to head out to our 8.15 a.m. soccer practice. I don't know who developed this schedule, but they are going to receive a scathing email from me at some point. And so we get up early in the morning, and if you remember a couple of Saturdays ago, if you were in town, it was rainy and cold outside. And I'm telling my son to dress warm. So I'm getting his sweatpants out of the drawer. But he already had his favorite soccer shorts on. And he was not about to take those things off. And so we're having this, in, this fight inside of our house. And, you know, I'm, I'm 34 and I can't defeat the will of a four-year-old. It's a really demoralizing thing, to be honest. And I cannot get him to put the sweatpants on. And so I look him in the eyes and I say, Carson, it's cold and it's raining outside. You're going to be cold. Do you understand that? He said, yes, I'll be fine. 
And so we go out to the park, we start practice, and wouldn't you know it, five minutes into practice, Carson comes running up to me and he says, Dad, it's cold. He said, my legs are freezing. And I said, hey, buddy, I know, but you better get back out there and keep playing. And if I sound cruel, it's perhaps because you don't have kids, right? So you gotta gotta go back out and play. Like, you made this bed, you're gonna sleep in it now. We're not leaving soccer, and I don't have sweatpants in the car for you. You know, Hey, as I was thinking about this, my son was mad at me in that moment. He's like, Dad, how could you? But the reality is I did not make my son cold, but because of his stubbornness, I allowed him to be cold. I said, if you want it that way, then fine, but you're going to need to be okay with reaping the very consequences from the decision that you're making. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in frustrating or difficult seasons or situations or scenarios in our life, and, it's, and can I be honest, it's not because of God But what if it's because of our own selfish and stubborn decisions? We want to get mad at God. How could you allow me to be going through this right now? And a lot of the time, more often than not, God said, I didn't do that to you. That was the decision that you made. He says, fine, you can can have it how you want it. And this is exactly what's happening to the people of God here. God says, if you don't want me, you don't have to have me. Friends, God will give you what you want, even when it's not him. He'll say, if you don't want me, that's fine. You can have what you want, but you're going, to be, you're going to have to be willing to take on and reap the consequences as a result. So they wind up being persecuted by Midian for seven years. And the persecution looked kind of like this. Every year in the time of harvest, right before the Israelites would harvest all of the crops they had been growing all season long, the Midianites would swoop in and they would take all of the food, leaving very little left for the people of Israel. Now, if you've seen the movie A Bug's Life, um, you fully understand this story, right, and what it looks like. And so they come and they would steal their harvest, and this has the people of God afraid. They've scattered, they're living in caves under this oppressive hand of Midian. But finally, the people of God, they get smart once again. And the scripture says that they begin to call out to God. And I think some of the good news today is this church, that when people start crying out, God starts calling out. When people start crying for help, God begins to search the earth looking for men and women that he can call to be a solution to the problem. Right? And so God begins to call. And who does he call in this moment? Well, he goes to a man named Gideon. And in verses 11 and 12 of Judges 6, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the tree at Ophrah. It belonged to Joash, to the clan of Abiezar. And Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing weeds at the bottom of a wine press. I don't, even, I don't know if you know this, but that's not where you thresh wheat. So he's threshing wheat in the wrong place. And he's doing this, the text says, to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I got to be honest with you. I get a little bit confused when I read this. So I'm looking at a man who is a farmer in hiding. And God comes to him and says, no, 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 you are a mighty hero. And I'm looking at this like, okay, God, what has Gideon done at this point to warrant that title? This man is clearly in hiding. He's not threshing wheat, which would have been done out in the open. He's doing it in a wine press under a tree in an enclosed space. He's officially hiding. And God says, I know you're hiding, but what I I see in you is a mighty warrior. And why this encourages me so much is because God wasn't speaking to who Gideon was. God was speaking to who he would become. And the good news for us today, church, is that God doesn't speak to and see you for who you were or even for who you are, but who you're becoming. God says, let me show you who you can become if you continue to walk in stride with me. You know, when it comes to our true identity, it's not about what I see, it's about what God says. What has God said? And God's word clearly says so many great things about us. But Gideon, just like so many of us, he had a hard time accepting this. He's like, I don't don't know. And we see this based on the nature of the conversation that they have. God says, you're a mighty hero. And here's exactly how Gideon responds. He says, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all the miracles of our ancestors that they told us about? And, And didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us? and handed us over to the Midianites. Gideon is officially frustrated at God. He says, God, my grandparents and my great-grandparents can speak of how great you are, but my entire life, I have not seen your greatness and your goodness, and so now you're gonna show up to tell us that you're with us, but where have you been? Wonder if you've been there before. 
or you hear the way your parents or your grandparents talk about God, or you read the text in the Bible of the Old and the New Testament, or maybe you look how God is working in the lives of other people, and I just wonder if there's anybody in here that's ever been in this position of frustration towards God. I want to try to encourage your heart today. And so he's upset with God. God, where have you been? My people are under an oppressive hand, and you've been nowhere to be found. And then it says this in verse 14. It says, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. You know what I love about this? And I find it interesting that oftentimes the very problems that we're most frustrated with God about are the very things that God is calling us to be the solution to. What frustrates you? You know, I heard a pastor say this to me about a decade ago and it's never left me. He said, what bothers you? What frustrates you? And I'm not talking about traffic as you're driving through the city. I'm not talking about long lines at Giant or Safeway. I'm talking about at a deep heart level, what frustrates you? What causes you to look up to God and say, God, what in the world is happening? What causes you to lay in bed at night saying, God, why have you not done anything to fix this? But I wonder if God sometimes looks at us and says, why haven't you? I, I partner with my people and I call my people and he says, I do miraculous things and I do powerful things, but only when my people are willing to step out in faith and say, God, my calling is gonna be a solution to a problem. And so then in verse 15, after God says, Gideon, I'm sending you. So Gideon goes from frustration now, now to excuse making. And he says, but Lord, how could I rescue Israel? My, my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh and I'm the least in my entire family. He's like, God, I'm from Manasseh. Ain't nobody ever heard about Manasseh. And he's like, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the runt of the litter. God, you obviously have got the wrong man. I'm not the guy. And he's beginning to make excuses. You know, the more I just sat and reflected throughout the week on this passage and what Gideon is saying, I begin to have this thought that I believe Gideon, when I think about himself, I don't think he made these things up about himself. I think these are things he's heard other people say. I think he's heard other people kind of rag on Manasseh. Like, you don't want to be from Manasseh, you know. I think he's heard other people within his own tribe say, bro, your family, like, y'all are pretty pathetic, man. You guys are one of the weakest, one of the smallest. Your dad didn't even have a good job. He can barely provide for your family. And then within that, maybe within his own family, people say, get in, you're the smallest, you're the youngest. You got to get out of here, man. You don't have a seat at the table. And this is the man that God comes to. And he says, look, I, I don't know, God, I'm not your guy. And I think Gideon's begun to believe the words of other people. But can I just say this today, and I hope this encourages somebody's heart in here, that you are not who others say you are. You're not even who you say you are. But the good news today is you are who God says you are. And if you want to know a little bit about what God says, God says if you're feeling like you're weak, that you are more than a conqueror through Christ. If you feel like you're, you've been left out, he says, no, you're chosen. If you feel like you can't be loved, he says, you are loved unconditionally. If you feel like I've done too much and I can't be forgiven, he says, in Christ, you are the righteousness of Christ. And if you feel broken, if you feel beat up, and if you feel dirty, he says, no, you are my masterpiece. These are the things that God says about us. And the beautiful thing is that it's not about what you say or others say, because ultimately what God says goes. You know, I've talked about this before, but I'm the youngest in my family. And I grew up with two older brothers. And I remember when I was about 16 years old, I started to drive. And we all shared a car. And if you ever try to share a car with siblings, it is like probably the most complicated thing on planet Earth to do. And so often I would need the car. I would be like, guys, I, I need to go somewhere. Or I have some budding 16-year-old love, you know. And I'm like, I got a hot date at Whataburger. I got to go, you know. And uh, my, my people from Texas shout amen, right? And... Uh, <laughs> Some of y'all don't know about the gospel of Whataburger, but I'm like, I got places to go. I got places to be. And more often than not, they say, no, 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 you're not taking the car. I'm going places. And I would be stuck at home. And I remember one day, it was a Friday. I went to my brothers and I said, can I please use the car tomorrow? I really need to go somewhere. And both of them said, absolutely not. And so then I immediately did what the youngest sibling in the family does. And I went to dad. And I said, dad, my brothers won't give me the car and I need it. And you know they never let me have the car. And he said, Brandon, you're absolutely right. It is your turn to have the car. You may take it. So I got up early on Saturday before my brothers were up. I took those keys and I left for the whole day. The whole day. They're texting me, where the heck are you? Where's the car? I'm ignoring these texts. I'm like, I don't need this kind of negativity in my life right now. I'm having a great time. And when I got home, they were upset. They were livid. They're like, we told you you couldn't take it and that we needed it. And I said, oh, what you don't understand is that I talked to dad. 
And dad said I could have the car. And I don't know if you remember how it works in this house. But in this house, what dad says goes. You know what I tell you that today to just remind you and maybe lift your chin and encourage your spirit today that it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what other people say. But based on what God says, what your father says, what God says goes. God's got the final word. Nobody else around you, no thing around you. God's got the final word. It's a weird analogy, but it'll stay with some of y'all. You know, after Gideon's last response of self-doubt and excuse making, let's look at how God responds to this. And so Gideon's like, I can't, I'm the runt and my family and all these things. And, and God responds like this. He says to him, Gideon, I will be with you. And you'll destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Isn't that interesting? God ignores every excuse Gideon makes. He doesn't address them. Not Manasseh's great, bro. No, your family is so awesome. You're the best, Gideon. I know you're short, but like you got this, bro. Like God doesn't address any of his insecurities. All he says is, I will be with you. You know, God responds the exact same way to the patriarch Moses. My wife earlier was up here. She was totally trying to steal my sermon. I don't know if you knew that. And what's funny is we didn't even communicate, but that's how God works. But Moses, if you've seen the prince of Egypt, you know the story, right? The burning bush, and God comes to Moses in this epic moment. He says, Moses, I'm calling you. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And what does Moses say? He says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And if you know the story, he talks about, I have a speech impediment and I just, I can't do this. How does God respond to Moses? In verse 12, he says, I will be with you. See, God's typical response to our protests of inadequacy and our inability is not to disagree with us and just try to tell us how great we are, but to remind us how present he is. I think God wants to encourage you. And he wants to tell you where you're gifted and he wants you to know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not trying to say that God doesn't want to tell you those things. But can I tell you, he's more concerned with you understanding that he's with you, that he's omnipresent. Like Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. You know, in, in one way or another, when it comes to our calling and God's saying it's, God, God basically says this, it's not you, it's me. I know in a romantic relationship, that's about the worst line you could ever hear. If you've ever been fed that line, we'll start a small group, we'll weep together. If you've ever fed that line, we're going to pray for you up at the front after this service and ask that the Lord would forgive you of your sins. But romantically, we don't want to hear that. But can I say spiritually, when it comes to the things of God, there's no better line to hear. It's not you, it's me. God says, I'm calling you, but hey, hey, it's not you, it's me. I'm, I'm asking you to do something that is out of your comfort zone, but guess what? It's not you, it's me. And God tries to bolster our confidence with the promise of his presence. His presence is everything. You know, Psalm 46, I was planning on reading only verse 1 today to you guys, but I was reading this this morning, and I actually want to read all of Psalm 46 to you and just relax. It's not that long. So here's what it says, Psalm 46, 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Other translations say an ever-present help. And then it says this, therefore I will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is is our fortress. Can we rest in that for a moment? The Lord of hosts, which is the name Jehovah Saba, the Lord who fights for us. He says he's with us. And I just know that maybe that's a word for somebody in this space today, that you walked in feeling abandoned by God. Maybe you felt like Gideon a little bit, saying, God, I see you working with other people. I hear about you working in other people's lives, but God, where have you been? Maybe you look up in the world right now and you see a world in turmoil and we're saying, God, where are you? And he's responding saying, I haven't left and I never will. God is with you. And I know that's a word for somebody in this space today, that God is with you. You know, there's a man named Brother Lawrence who lived uh, many uh, centuries ago and he 
was a man who wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And he was a monk, and what he writes in this book, it's like, it's so spiritually frustrating because this man's relationship with God is unlike anything I've ever experienced and can only long for. But he says this, the most holy and important practice in the spiritual life is the presence of God. But how do you practice the presence of God? He gives us the answer. That is in every moment to take great pleasure that God is with you. When was the last time, church, that you just took pleasure in the reality that God is present? That God is with you in your home, in your, in your room, your dorm room, in your car, in your situation. God is with you. He's ever present. He's our ever present help in trouble. I got to continue on in this story. And Gideon receives this call, but then he's a little bit hesitant and he begins to ask God for a sign. He's like, Lord, okay, I'll do this, but I need to make sure that it's you. And he asked God for three different signs. He's like, I just need a little extra assurance that you're going before me. And you know, I'm pretty convinced that God loves it when we're willing to go, like when we're willing just to go on faith. But we also see that God is gracious and that God is patient with us even when we need a little extra assurance. And that's good news, right? How many of you have felt like you've ever just needed a little extra assurance from God, right? And he has patience with us. I remember this story has come up several times over the past several weeks because we're talking about faith. And one of the biggest faith steps in my life was my family moving from New Mexico to DC to start this church. And I remember my wife and I, back in 2019 and 2020, that having this, this sense inside of our heart that, okay, God, I be- we believe that you're calling us to plant the church in D.C. And we felt it. We had a conviction about it. But we were still a little bit afraid and had a little bit of hesitancy. So she and I, we start praying. We're like, God, you know, it's great that we feel like you told us. But, God, could you tell someone else to come tell us? Like, we need some third-party confirmation. And it just so happened that we were at a church conference at our home church. It was the third night. I mean, this was church camp for grown-ups. Like, God was moving. People were worshiping. People were being healed. At the end of that third night, in the altar time, as people are being prayed over and we're singing, the speaker, he says, hey, uh, Delaney and Brandon, would you guys come up here on stage? Just kind of calls us out of nowhere. And we get up on stage, and we're holding hands, fully unsure of what's about to happen. And he begins to speak over us and begins to prophesy and say, I want to tell you what I feel like the Spirit of God is telling me right now. And he said that I believe there's a church inside of you that God has been birthing. And he said there's a new stream that's going to come out of the two of you. And I was like, okay, that's confirmation that God wants us to plant a church. Hallelujah, amen. That's amazing. But then he keeps going. And the man begins to get specific. And not just talking about a church plan, but he starts talking about this city. He starts talking about the White House, and he starts talking about the Capitol and Capitol Hill, and begins to make it abundantly clear. You know, we walked up on that stage, having said yes to God kind of timidly, but we walked off that stage saying yes to God confidently and saying, thank you, God, for confirming the call in our lives. This happened in front of 2,000 people. How many know that's some prophecy with some high levels of accountability? We have people coming up to us after service like, yo, when are you planting a church in D.C.? And I'm like, hold up, I need to process what just happened, right? This was crazy. It's one of the, the craziest, most God-filled moments of my life. And God gave us the confirmation we were looking for. But how many of you know God doesn't always give you that kind of confirmation? Sometimes you're praying and asking, like, Lord, give me a sign. You're looking at license plates going by. You're checking, like, the billboards, I remember watching the Nats win the World Series in 2019 and being like, God, is that you? Like, is this the sign? Am I supposed to go? I was, looking, I was desperate. I was looking for anything. But sometimes God doesn't speak like that. What do we do in those moments? What I love to tell people is this, that it's in those moments where you're, you want to move on a maybe, that it's important that you have godly counsel around you. When you make decisions in isolation, be prepared to make some poor decisions. But you got to bring in other people. Do I have a mom and dad who are in the faith that could give me advice on this? Do I have siblings or peers that love the Lord and just have my best interest in mind? Do I have pastors I can go to? Have I prayed about this? Do I have a peace in my spirit about what God is calling me to? And if you want to make good decisions, then include other people in those decisions. But I'm telling you, you got to include the right people. You ever got advice from the wrong person before? Yeah, they're everywhere, right? And some of them, as a secret, are in this room. Okay, you guys got to be careful. I don't know who they are. That's not prophetic, but I've gotten bad advice in church before. So just make sure you're looking at where you're going to get good advice. I got to continue on the story. So then Gideon in chapter seven, God has anointed him and empowered him and he begins to amass an army. And I'm impressed by what Gideon does. Gideon gets together an army of 32,000 fighting men. And I'm like, dang, Gideon, I'm impressed. The only problem is that Midian's army was not 32,000 men. It was 135,000 soldiers. 
So Gideon's already outnumbered more than four to one. And God comes to Gideon and does things that only God does. And he says, Gideon, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your army is just far too big. So we got to do something about this. Gideon's like, wait, did I just misunderstand? Well, you just said, he said, yeah, your, your army's too big. He says, what I want you to do is go to, to the army, the soldiers, and say, if any of you are afraid, you can, you can go home. And I think Gideon probably approached this moment with some level of confidence. Like, these are grown men who are ready to fight for their country and fight for their, their families. No one's going to be afraid. And so Gideon stands up. He says, okay, if you're afraid, you can go. 22,000 men leave right in that moment. So now Gideon's left with 10,000 men. He's outnumbered more than 13 to 1. And God looks at the 10,000 men. He says, Gideon, I got bad news. It's just still way too many. And so God tells him to go down to the brook and have all the men drink from the brook. And he says, I'll, I'll kind of divide it up based on how they drink. And it just so happens that 9,700 men drink one way and 300 men drink another way. And God says, I'll take the 300. Send the 9,700 home. So now Gideon, up against 135,000 fighting men, is down to 300 men. This, is, this means that he's outnumbered 450 to 1. And it's at this moment that God says, all right, this looks great. I like these odds. Okay, this is, this is an awesome moment. And I don't know about you, but if I'm Gideon, this is probably the part of the story that I bow out. And I'm like, God, this has been cute so far. Thank you for calling me a mighty warrior. Thank you for helping me amass an army. But you just whittled this thing down and stripped this down to 300 men. I'm not doing this anymore. Now, this is probably where most of us, if we haven't already, this is where most of us are going to bow out. But then the story gets even more bizarre. And God begins to give Gideon the battle strategy for these 300 men against 135,000. And certainly Gideon's like, all right, God, we got some secret weapons up in here somewhere, right? He's thinking we got flaming arrows, you know, giant catapults with flaming boulders. And much of my life has been formed by Lord of the Rings. So that's kind of what I feel when I see, when I think about battle. And God comes to Gideon, he's like, no, we're not, we're not having flaming arrows and giant catapults. He says, here's what you're gonna give each of these 300 soldiers. You're gonna give each man a torch. And Gideon's like, all right, that's fire. We can, we can work with that. We can light some stuff on fire, burn it down. Give him a torch. You're going to give each man a trumpet. And Gideon's all like, all right. Guess we can like call in the cavalry that you've been like building. You've been talking to somebody else and they'll come. Then the last thing he says, and then I, I want to give each man a clay jar. And Gideon's like, this is outrageous. <laughs> I want you to give him a torch, a trumpet, and a clay jar. I love to put myself in these stories and imagine being Gideon, going to your 300 soldiers. They're like, what's God got for us, man? He's like, you're never going to believe it. A torch, a trumpet, and a clay jar. They're like, okay, this is great. We're going to do some serious damage with these clay jars uh, with the Midianites. This is like the worst plan of all time. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but God kind of specializes in bad plans, at least from our perspective. Do you remember the story of Jericho? Walk around the city for seven days. And then just shout at the walls and let's see what happens. And everyone's like, this, this doesn't make any sense. What I love is that God operates in ways that don't make sense to us. Let me say it this way to you today, church. It's not about the plan. It's about my faith. And for all of you planners in the room, you're disagreeing. You're, no, no, you're like, no, it's about the plan, Brandon. It's about the schedule and the calendar. No, no, no. God will blow up your plans and your calendar and your schedule. It's not about his plan. It's about my faith. I think some of us need to stop today obsessing over, trying to figure out how God's going to get me there and just ask yourself, am I willing to go? Am I willing to step out? I don't know how he's going to do it, but I'll, I'll step. So if Gideon is his men, they're already vastly outnumbered, 450 to one. And then God gives the next part of the strategy, which gets even worse. He says, I want you to go in the middle of the night, surround the Midianite camp. It's up on, it's in a valley, so you've got this mountain all around it. And then I don't want you to sneak in and try to attack them in the middle of the night. I want you to draw as much attention to yourselves as humanly possible. Just gets worse and worse. And what blows my mind about these guys is they actually go. Like they, they go to the Midianite camp. They're outgunned, outmanned, and outplanned for all you Hamilton fans out there. You know, I wonder if any of you have ever found yourself in a similar position. Right, or even right now in your life where you're up against something you can't defeat. You're facing a problem that you can't solve. You're trying to walk in faith, but it seems like God just keeps pulling the rug out from under you. And maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're lost, maybe it looks like defeat is inevitable. I wonder if there's areas of your life where you 
have felt or you feel helpless and you're on the verge of becoming hopeless. You've got questions that have gone unanswered. You're lacking faith and you've just been bombarded by doubts. You're suffering physically in your body. Maybe your marriage is under attack. You're at odds with your spouse. And maybe it's been that way for months or years or decades. You've got an addiction that you can't seem to break that has you bound. You've experienced job loss and maybe a sense of purposelessness and wandering. Maybe you've got a dream, but you don't think you have the skills or the tools or the people around you or the resources to make it happen. I know I've talked to people in this church, maybe you've got anxiety that just won't go away and it's crippling. Depression that overwhelms and seems to rear its ugly head at all the wrong moments and seasons of your life. Maybe you're in a spiritual battle and you feel like the enemy just has your number. And so for many of us, we've, we're in or we've been in seasons or we might be in one in the future where defeat seems inevitable. Well, I wanna draw your attention back to the story of Gideon because God strips him down to nothing, gives him 300 men with no weapons. And so can I just be honest, church? Defeat was inevitable. Gideon and his men are walking into certain death if God does not show up. Certain death, no surviving this. And what is God doing to Gideon, you might be asking? As he strips away everything, what God is doing is he's removing anything else that Gideon could have put his trust in or his confidence in for victory. Everything's gone. They can take zero credit. Everything is stripped away. He didn't have who he needed and he didn't have what he needed, but the reality is, church, we'll never know that God is all we need until God is all we have. So you might be in a season where you're like, God, are you taking stuff from me right now? I thought you were the God who gives. You're Jehovah Jireh, provide for me. And guess what? Jehovah Jireh will sometimes take from you. I promise you that. That may sound, that might mess up your theology a little bit. But God will strip us to the bone sometimes so that we can finally get to the point where we quit relying on ourselves and our own power and we begin to rely on the power of our almighty God. We will not experience real power until we have this revelation. See, God will strip things away. And it's not to make you vulnerable, it's to make you powerful. Do you remember the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians? We've talked about this a couple times over the last couple of months. And Paul is saying, God, I'm in a trial. I'm suffering and I need your help. I need you to take something away from me. And God says, no. And what does he say? My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Gideon's story and the Apostle Paul's words emphasize human weakness and inadequacy are opportunities for God's power to shine. You want to see God shine? Then you got to become okay with your weaknesses. Right, and not looking at God and saying, why are you making me weak and what are you doing to me? But saying, God, obviously if you're pulling things away from me right now, I need to step back because you're about to do something that I can never do on my own. And God is saying, in your weakness, you will become more aware of my power and my goodness than you've ever been in your life. Because I think it's at that point that we can finally get out of the way and let God step in and do what only he can do. You see, for Gideon, the results of this was military victory. For Paul, the result was the ability to endure trials and keep moving forward in faith. And so Gideon and his men, they stand on that mountain looking down at the Midianite army. And as I mentioned last week, as A.W. Tozer said, that these Old Testament stories can become the perfect illustrations of the life of spiritual living that we are called to live today. And I think this is one of those great examples. I don't know if there's a greater example in all of Scripture of somebody saying that when I am weak, then I am strong, than this moment that Gideon stands on this mountain. He is in utter weakness. God has taken everything from him, and he does what God tells him to do. The men on Gideon's order, they sound the trumpets, waking up the Midian people. They break the jars, they light their torches, and in unison they shout together, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And what this does is it causes great confusion in the camp. And the people wake up out of a groggy sleep. And if you've ever woken up after you've taken some melatonin or you're groggy and you're like fighting spiders and things that aren't there, that's exactly what's happening. They're they're confused and God has brought a confusion on the people and they start to fight each other. 
And Gideon and his men just stand there in disbelief, like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. They're killing each other. We're not even having to do this. And the army gets to such a small size that they have to flee, and Gideon and his men pursue, and they have victory. And what's so crazy to me is they have victory, and they never even had to fight. Which reminds me, as I mentioned ago, a moment ago, that God is our Jehovah Saba, right? He is the Lord that fights our battles. And the good news today is that if you're in the middle of a battle, God's not expecting you to win it yourself. He's expecting you in your weakness and in your faith to step back and say, God, would you step in and be true to who you are and true to your word? And would you fight this battle on my behalf? Because I can't do it on my own. God says, you have the faith. Give me the fight. How do we have how do we fight by faith? We, we rely on God. We put faith in the one that'll fight for us. Let me give you a few scriptures to encourage you. Exodus 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Deuteronomy 3, do not be afraid of them. The Lord, your God himself will fight for you. First Samuel 17, David facing Goliath says, the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Second Chronicles 20, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And let's go to the New Testament, Romans 8, 31. If you know it, finish it with me. For if God is for us, who can be against us? Guys, we have a God that's for us. And he's not only with us and he's not only for us, but he will fight for us. What if we relinquish some of the battle? What if today there's some of us that we're still battling something we could have had victory over long ago? And not for lack of effort, but what if we sometimes in our own efforts, we're actually causing ourselves to stand in the very space that God is saying, I need you to give me that ground. We step back and say, God, would you fight for me? Would you fight my battle? The moral of the story, guys, is not to sit back and let God do everything. If you go back and read the story of Gideon, God has Gideon do a lot of stuff. Gideon has to amass the army. He has to be a part of shrinking the army. He has to get the weapons together. They have to go. God is going to give you much to do, but ultimately it's this. Do everything the Lord has called you to do and then step back and let the Lord do what only he can do. That's the moral of the story today. If you guys would stand to your feet. I just want to take a moment of response today. and I won't call anybody forward, but just three groups of people that I want to ask a question of today to know maybe this is you and I can be praying for you. So if you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, everyone in the room. Three things today. Maybe you're somebody in here and earlier in the message as I was talking about how Gideon quite possibly was allowing other people to define him. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, Brandon, I have not let the words of God and the words of scripture define me, but I'm allowing other people. You've allowed what a grandparent or a parents, a friend, a roommate, somebody on social media, you're allowing what they've said about you to define you. But today you want to say, I, I want to walk in how God what God says about me and not what I see in me. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just raise a hand really quickly? I want to know who I could be praying for. God's identity over you. Okay, you guys can put your hands down. The second group are just those of us in here that, like Gideon, we want to be used by God. We see problems around us that we want to be a part of solving, but maybe you feel inadequate. And so you got excuses. God, I'm not good enough. God, I just, I think you got the wrong man or the wrong woman. But today you want to say, Lord, I confess that it's not about my ability, but my availability. But if you felt inadequate to be used by God, would you lift a hand? I want to know if I could pray for you. I just want to encourage you today that God sees you and God can and will use you. You just got to make yourself available. And the third response today is simply this. If you're going through a battle right now that you feel like you can't have victory on your own, but you need the Lord to step in. You say, you, you say Brent, I've been fighting this on my own and I'm struggling all the categories I laid out earlier, if I missed yours, whatever it might be. But I need the God of angel armies to step in today. Like he fought for Gideon, like he was with Moses, like he was with the people as they marched around Jericho. I need his presence and I need his ability today. Would you guys raise a hand today if you're facing something? It's about half the room. If you raise a hand for any of the three, would you raise your hands back up? I wanna pray for you, keep it up high. Let's pray together. If you're near somebody that has a hand raised, you can just extend a hand towards somebody. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, God, today I just pray your identity over each and every one of us. We are not who others say we are. We are not even who we say we are. We are who you say we are, God. And so we right now walk in your identity. God, not what we see, but what you say and what you have said about us. 
Remind us today that we are loved. We are more than conquerors. We are mighty warriors in your hand. For those who feel unqualified, based on their abilities or their past or their sin or whatever's going on in their life, remind us, Lord, that it's not about us being qualified, Lord. It's not about our ability, but our availability. So we humbly place ourselves in your hands and say, God, use us and use us powerfully, Lord. And for those of us who are facing a mountain, who are walking through the deepest valley, who are up against the largest giants that loom in front of us, that loom large in front of us, Lord, we decry and we declare right now that you are the God who fights for us. And so in our weakness, we give you our weakness. And would you supplant our weakness with your strength? Give us your strength, God. Show us. In this miracle season, God, would you be the God of miracles? Do what only you can. Restore relationships. Heal our physical bodies. Help our finances, God. Give us the courage that we need. Heal our anxiety. Heal our depression in Jesus' name. Whatever we battle, we give it to you. The battle is not ours. It is the Lord's. We love you. We thank you, Jesus, for winning the ultimate battle over our sin. As you hung on the cross. Thank you for defeating, defeating death, hell, and the grave. Now that we look to you, Jesus, our sin is forgiven. And we are made new and righteous in you. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.